Welcome to the We Are Libertarians Daily Podcast. I am your guest host, Toadie Johns, and I am joined by kind of a superhero, and you're going to be really excited, but this is Alicia Dern, who I am sure if you've been part of the libertarian movement or party before, you know and love, and if not, you've seen her car in full libertarian colors driving down the highway. Alicia, how are you doing today? I'm great. How are you? I am, I am great. I am great. I thank you so much for your time. They say time is money. In my case, that's not true. It's uh, <laughs> pennies, if that. And I know that even 30 minutes with you is a few thousand dollars that you could be uh, could be making on, uh, you know, saving the world and with clients and pulling people out of prison and all those mm -hmm. other heroic things you do. So I appreciate you making the time to join us today. Thank you. Lovely to be here. This was, and I don't know if this makes you feel better, this was actually a personal request from somebody. Not only the story, but they actually wanted your perspective on it, too. So okay. uh, what we have is a story <clears throat> out of Texas, uh, a rapper named Na Na, capital N, lowercase a, capital N, lowercase a. Now, I'm a white guy, so any Na Na's I know are like the Batman theme song. And... Uh, <laughs> But this is uh, this is a rapper, and he was I uh, I and I believe confessed to distribution of cocaine, which uh, carries a uh, something like a six year sentence around it, and uh, the judge took a look at some violent rap lyrics, and ended up sentencing him to ten years instead of the usual six. So Alicia, break down break that down for me. Uh, first of all, introduce yourself and why I'm giving you such author authority over the law. And uh, tell me what your take is on that. All right. Well, uh, as you said, my name is Alicia Dern. Uh, I have been practicing law since 2004, uh, and including in federal courts. And so I, I'm here to speak about why a judge would enhance a sentence like that. So now we're talking federal court mm -hmm. uh, in, in Texas. You can be charged in both state and federal courts for drug crimes. Uh, the state courts are all over capacity, so a lot of these cases are being pushed up into the federal courts. Uh, looks like that's what happened here. Uh, he uh, did a plea deal for uh, the cocaine possession. So, you know, people don't just like cop to uh, to crimes typically without a plea deal, but a judge can decide what they're going to charge them or what they're going to sentence them to, um, regardless of what the plea deal says. So I don't know what was recommended by the prosecutor, but uh, he obviously got up and, and pled guilty. And then the judge has uh, sentencing guidelines. Sentencing guidelines are uh, mandatory in federal court. And so they have to do a mandatory minimum, but they can enhance from the minimum based on factors that they find. And so this judge looked at the lyrics and determined that they were basically bragging about crimes that he committed and decided that he should have an enhancement on his sentence as a result. Now is now so let me two part question. First part, is that legal for a judge to do? Is that encouraged or is that mandatory for them to look at it and say, "Oh, I've noticed this about your personal life. I'm going to sense you more or less outside of the scope of the actual crime you've confessed to." It's legal for the judge to do it. So the judge can look at uh, evidence of mitigating factors. That's typically what happens is that the defense attorney gets up and says, you know, yes, this person committed a crime, but, you know, they've got 12 children and they were broke and they have mental illness or all these things that would help the judge reduce the sentence within the guidelines. Um, but sometimes there, the prosecution present, presents evidence that shows that the person actually uh, should have an enhanced sentence because they're particular what they did was particularly heinous. So uh, it wouldn't be that the judge went and like researched this herself. At some point along the line, she was given this evidence, probably by the prosecution, um, and considered it as part of his character. So even though it's outside of the scope of what he actually pled to, it's within uh, what she feels was essentially admissions to his uh, his criminal behavior. Now, in this case, he he's an entertainer, right? He's a rapper. And so I, I, would I be wrong to, to disagree with the judge? Because he, I, I believe the lyrics went something along the lines of shooting someone eight times in the face. 
yeah. uh, over a drug deal gone bad. He obviously did no such thing. And this is very common among rappers. I, mm-hmm. I had to look up, uh, uh, there's a nice Google uh, list of rappers that have claimed they've murdered somebody. Right. Uh, and, <laughs> and they are all very fact- fictitious and very fantastical, right? Very, very, right. Uh, now, as a right. right-wing Christian parent, you might say, I don't know that I like those lyrics, but would I sentence someone to an extra four years in prison for those lyrics? Right. So I, I also disagree with the sentence. And the reason I disagree with it is precisely what you say. So he was not convicted of murder. He was convicted of possession of cocaine with intent to distribute. So whether or not he actually committed a murder is unknown and it wasn't before the court. And so you know, if he had been convicted, if he had actually been convicted of shooting somebody eight times and then the rap lyrics were cited to show that he had no remorse, that to me makes a lot more sense because, you know, you anything you say can, outside of court can be used against you. And that includes your rap lyrics. You know, so if you confess to a crime in a rap, then that can be used against you. But in this particular case, the state did not pr- have the evidence to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he committed murder, I assume, because they didn't seem to have charged him with that, or they cert- he certainly didn't plead to that. Um, and it would be unlikely for the U.S. Attorney's Office to drop a murder charge on a plea deal unless they didn't have good evidence. So I'm, I'm thinking that probably um, the murder charge was was either non-existent, he didn't do it, or whatever. Uh-huh. So yeah, I, I agree with you that the uh, that it's problematic to put somebody in jail for four years for exercising speech, even if the speech is bragging about something that would be heinous. Uh, to normal people, you're still allowed to speak. You know, you you don't have to, us as listeners don't have to like the speech for speech to protect it. Now, being that like a thousand plus people are going to listen to this podcast, are they right to suddenly, I just feel like I felt a collective like thousand plus people get really scared about things they've typed on Facebook out of (laughs) anger or hate or exaggeration in the past. Is there any boundary between that and this? That situation. No, uh, no. I, I, here's the thing. Anything you put on social media is public and can be used against you at a future date. So I w- generally would suggest that even in jest, you should not say or speak violent things because it can be used against you in ways that you wouldn't imagine. Um, and that's the kind of thing that I come across all the time in litigation. Like somebody's made some stupid joke online. And now they've got a restraining order and judges think that they're violent people and all this stuff because it's out of context or because they've, they've said it. So just be careful what you put out there in public. But, at, you know, for a rapper, this is art and it is. And so it should be really treated carefully before we start um, sentencing people to enhance sentences because of the artwork that they put out there that we are absolutely certain that that. Uh, that that rap was actually admission to a crime. And, and from what I read in the article, that's what the judge thinks it was. But if there isn't any evidence besides that, which is what his defense attorneys are saying, that's that's a problematic thing. Um, I do think that, uh, I, I will say for certain, he will appeal this. Um, almost all things are appealed in criminal court, so it wouldn't even be unusual for him to appeal it. Um, but whether the Fifth Circuit uh, decides to uphold the sentence or not is a different question. Okay. It's Texas. They tend to be the Fifth Circuit's very conservative when it comes to the criminal justice uh, stuff. The judge is probably going to be given deference. So that's a little scary. It, I mean, it's very scary. Like I said, I'm, I mean, I'm thinking about everything that I've said in public now. Now, are, do Miranda rights come into this at all? Like if I've been told anything you say can and will be used against you in court, how is that? You, I've been told that that's proactive and not retroactive of everything that I've said before. You're right. saying you're telling me that's not the case, though. That no, I'm, oh, I'm telling you is that once once you're arrested, okay. So anything you say publicly can be used against you at any time period. Okay. And uh, once you're arrested, you get detained and they arrest you. Mm-hmm. Um, then they have to Mirandize you at that point to warn you against speaking to the police. So that's where your Fifth Amendment right that okay. allows you the right to remain silent. But anything you put out in the public domain. Or if you're talking to your jail cell mate, you know, they record that stuff. They put plants in jail cells. Like there's all kinds of ways that um, the police get admissions out of people that can be used against them that you that are very sneaky and you wouldn't realize. So let's let's move to the next step of this then. What 
how are how is the libertarian to react both to this case and to maybe the climate in the country in general? What can we do culture wise, politically? What can we say? Is there a movement to get behind? What do we do to stop this type of thing? Because we see it happen here with this rapper who we may or may not like. And then, like I said, you think about your Facebook wall. And then what's it? The average person unknowingly commits three felonies a day without knowing it or something. And then all of a sudden you get arrested for something like that. And then the thing you said on your Facebook wall about your ex. And then all of a sudden you're in a lot of trouble. What do we do? Well, I think that we need to to really pursue uh, criminal justice reform in this country. Our civil rights have been massively eroded in this area, I think, more than any other area. To me, the the mass incarceration we have is a human rights crisis in this country. Uh, And the reason we have mass incarceration is because of the drug war, because militarization of the police and all the deference that the courts give to the trial judges in favor of uh, heavy enforcement and uh, draconian sentences. So we have all these victimless crimes resulting you know, in people's lives being ruined because they're now in, you know, convicted of crimes and in jail for years, or even if they're on probation, they've got records. Uh, we've got police who know that they can abuse our civil rights and do because they can get away with it because the judges give them deference, the juries give them deference, and the Court of Appeals give them deference. Uh, There has to be, I think, a focus. And and this is not just something libertarian. I think that a lot of groups in the country could work together to really focus on how bad and abusive the criminal justice system has gotten and, and that it's turned us into a very scary police state. Since we're... Getting there on time, give me Alicia Dern's number one thing to fix about criminal justice reform. Where do we, where's, what's number one? Me, it's always the drug war. I, we need to decriminalize drugs. Uh, I think that if we decriminalize drugs, even, even if we just did marijuana to start, uh, reduction in violent crime would be tremendous. Not only would we let out all of these vi- uh, nonviolent uh, criminals and allow people to live their lives and to reform and, and to be m- good members of society, but we would reduce the violent crime. You know, when you have an economy, a black market economy around drugs, those people are still, they're, they're still doing business, but they're their own enforcement. So if somebody doesn't pay them, they respond with violence instead of with a lawsuit. And so, you know, that's why we have so much violent crime. We have smuggling, we have fighting with the police. Yeah. We can get rid of murder we could massively drop the murder rates and the assault rates and the the gun crime rates if we simply uh decriminalized drugs and treated it as a public health issue it's one of those things where i probably wouldn't get along personally with like nana but him having cocaine with the intent to sell it i don't like that either I'm not a recreational cocaine guy, but I also don't hate him to the point where I want to pay to house him for a long time. And I really don't want to pay to house him for an extra four years because he made some goofy lyrics. Like I'm paying me, the taxpayer, I'm going to pay four years of room and board and housing and food for somebody that I don't like now. Right. Right. And now his life is potentially ruined when he gets back out what's he going to do he's going to have to resort back to crime because he's going to be unemployable uh and somebody else has just filled his shoes because there's the demand for cocaine like i have never once used cocaine i will never use cocaine that's not just me good (laughs) (laughs) i'm not a recreational drug user uh and i don't want my family members and my loved ones to be addicted to drugs but i would much rather treat that like we do alcoholism uh, a, as a, a public health issue, or like we should be treating you know, um, opioids and things like that, we should treat this as people have a disease that they need help with. Uh, it, when we start trying to criminalize behavior like that, we absolutely fail. We saw it in the prohibition area with um, alcohol. We, it's not like this is a novel idea. <laughs> you know, we know what happens when you decriminalize. Yeah. We know what happens with Portugal. Uh, why people are so, so much emotion around this and they're not thinking clearly about all the lives that they're ruining by having a uh, heavy war on drug law enforcement instead of, uh, you know, health care for people who are addicted. 
Right. I'm saying even if you hate the drug, even if you're talking out of hate for drug users, don't you love your own money enough that you don't want <laughs> right. to pay for it? Well, okay. So we're getting, we're, we're there. Uh, we do a thing called final thoughts on the network. I will give you my final thoughts. Uh, and that is, I think that Alicia is spot on when she says we need to start with drug reform because there's a lot of things that libertarians believe that the rest of the country is frankly not ready for yet, doesn't want yet, and they're scared of. And, you know, we'll, we'll work them there. We'll work them there. But one of the things that they've come around on is this drug war. Everybody's sick of it. The right wing is sick of paying for it. The left wing is sick of getting caught for it and it's become abusive and it's one of those that we can absolutely unite libertarians have been on right right on this even when it was unpopular mm -hmm. congratulations libertarians it's popular now <laughs> finally you get to do the popular thing and get out there and make the popular message so i just say strike while the iron is hot on this make sure libertarians that you get out there encourage your republican and democrat allies to unite with you and say we are going to make some real change in this generation in the benefit of freedom. Now, I'm gonna turn the final thoughts over to you, but also tell people what you're up to, shameless promotion. Uh, <laughs> how can they reach you if they have more questions for you, anything like that? Okay, great. Well, my final thoughts is Canada just decriminalized uh, marijuana for recreational and uh, med medicinal use. That is such a great step forward, I think, for Canada. And I think that the United States might follow. So, you know, we won't get, I'd like to see all drugs decriminalized, but we uh, may start with marijuana, then maybe it becomes less scary to all the people who are worried that the streets are going to be overrun with drug addicts. So uh, I, I see that as a good thing. And as far as what I'm doing, I'm, uh, I'm practicing law as usual and kind of all over the place. Um, I, I am happy to answer questions if anybody needs any legal advice or uh, wants to reach out to me. My law firm is called Bellatrix. That's B as in boy, E-L-L-A-T-R-I-X. It's named after a star in Orion. Um, and uh, my website is bellatrixlaw.com. I have a contact page with all of my information or you can email us through there um, and we'll get back to you with any help we can provide. Awesome. Thank you again so much for uh, your valuable time, Alicia, and putting your input or giving us your input on this subject. It means a lot to us on the network and your expertise is a lot better than anything I would have given them. <laughs> Thank you for having me. No problem at all. You folks have a great day.